Welcome to SES Global Services webinar on BRC certification. Uh, today we're going to be talking about upgrading from HACCP or GMP audits. And we'll be speaking with uh, two experts in the field, John Kakoli, who is a senior member of the BRC Global Standards team, and Javed Acha, who is a certified BRC trainer, consultant, and an SES trainer who's been working with us for about five years now. SES has been in the food and ag business for more than 25 years. We uh, provide training and testing and certification services for a wide variety of programs, and BRC is one of our foremost specialties. Uh, I'm Diane Delmage, and I've been with SES for five years now and have been supporting both public and in-house training. So today I'd like to introduce our first um, presenter, that's John Cacoli. He, um, John has responsibility for the technical and marketing initiatives of BRC standards in the Americas. He has over 20 years experience in the food industry and has been working with major manufacturing organizations and certification bodies. And he's played a key role in the advancement of BRC. He works closely with GFSI, retailers, and manufacturer and certification bodies to ensure that BRC is a very respected GFSI program globally. John? Good afternoon to everyone. Just want to make sure that everyone uh, can hear me properly. I'll wait for Diane to send me a quick note to make sure everything is good. And we'll continue on. Glad to have you here. Uh, looking forward to giving you a little bit of information about the BRC Global Standard. I'm going to flip to the presentation and uh, turn the camera off now. And uh, as we go along, please enter any questions you have. Most of them will probably wait till the end so we have enough time for everything. But uh, we'll continue on. So a little bit about BRC certification. BRC itself uh, originated in the in, in the UK. It was originally the British Retail Consortium, a trade association for retailers uh, in North in uh, the UK. But for the past several years, it has been a global food safety standard and the largest of the GFSI standards. Uh, this consortium itself, primarily retailers. These were companies that were auditing their supply chain, uh, and the intent was to have a singular uh, audit that would be, a lot, would be accepted by all of the retailers within the UK. And we've seen that spread through to North America, that same perspective. So a little bit about our relationship with GFSI, just to make sure it's quite clear for everyone. Uh, typically in the industry, uh, we hear that um, our customers are looking for GFSI certification or a GFSI certification. GFSI itself is not a standard. It's a international association of retailers and manufacturers, primarily in the food industry, and under which there are a number of different options or standards that individual manufacturers have a choice of uh, moving towards in order to satisfy those retailers' demands. Globally, those that are um, accepted, on the left hand we have the agricultural um, standards, those that are used for farms, Global Gap, Canada Gap, and Primus. On the right-hand side, we have the manufacturer standards for processing of food. BRC, of course, being the largest, SQF, IFS, and FSSC 22000. Those are the currently accepted uh, GFSI standards uh, that are available for use. Of course, three of the biggest in the U.S., and certainly the three that uh, SCS provides, Global Gap for farms, SQF, and BRC for manufacturers and processors. A little bit about GFSI, the Global Food Safety Initiative. What this is, is this is a group of the largest international and national retailers and manufacturers, and it's an equally balanced group. And they're part of the Cons Consumer Goods Forum. And their focus is to ensure the food safety supply is efficiently and consistently managed so that consumers have faith and trust in that uh, supply chain. It was achieved, or it was created to achieve a harmonization of standards, not an, equal, not an equalization. Standards aren't intended to all be identical, nor are they intended to merge to one another. They are, they are expected to have that competitive um, aspect to, their, to the market. Um, but what GFSI does, it, create, it has a common benchmarking element that allows all of the standards to ensure they have at least a minimum set of food safety, GMPs, HACCP, prerequisites, 
and food safety management systems involved in them. Now, within those, st those standards that I had mentioned that were all seen as equivalent by your customers, the, there are some variations, and GFSI focuses only on food safety. They don't look at some aspects such as food quality. They don't look at aspects like animal welfare, social compliance, or anything beyond those four basic tenants, GMPs, HACCP prerequisites, and food safety management systems. So that's where you start to see a little bit of variation between the schemes and what they offer. What GFSI did, as I mentioned, they do not they, have, they are not a standard unto themselves. They've created a set of requirements for standards, a benchmarking system. This model develops equivalency for the common elements around food safety and allow flexibility for the manufacturers to choose which standard suits them best. Very much like buying a car, you have a basic idea of has to have four wheels, has to have carry four passengers, has to get certain mileage. But beyond that, there's a lot of individual choice and variation between how those, what the, what the final model or what the final outcome looks like. The main perspective, and this is the center bullet point that GFSI has brought forward, once certified, that audit is accepted everywhere. So if you supply to a, manu to a manufacturer, you supply an ingredient in here in North America, or you supply a finished product to a retailer, they will not dictate which of the schemes you choose. That's yours to do. BRC itself, we've been around since 1998, so we've been quite, a, we're on our sixth version. We've been certified or benchmarked to the GFSI program right from the very beginning. We were the first scheme to go through the benchmarking process and have maintained with uh, that as part of our scheme's um, benefits. What does that mean to you? Here are, lists, here are a number of companies, and this, this slide came from GFSI itself. Uh, the GFSI website, mygfsi.com, has a lot of good information about it. And here's an idea of some of those customers that look at their supply chain and, say, and utilize GFSI certification as part of their oversight, part of their supplier performance and supplier approval program. Now, you see a mix of retailers, food service, and manufacturers in here. Those manufacturers also look to their ingredient suppliers. That's how they use it, but they also use it for their own corporate structure, their own corporate management of their program so that they have a consistent food safety or food quality program across their entire organizations. And of course, this is just a sample list. This is some of the bigger companies that have stepped forward within GFSI. In North America and in Europe, uh, and, and indeed more and more around the world, the majority of customers are, or th that you're going to deal with are looking for some sort of proof that, G that you have a consistent and a um, effective food safety program. One other item name that could very closely be put on here or, or that would certainly evaluate GFSI and sees uh, the impact and the value of it would be the FDA with the Food Safety Modernization Act. And discussions we've had with them as far as what GFSI provides and what type of oversight, they're very interested in and we're continuing to have discussions with them about it. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on BRC now, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Javid, who's going to give you some information on more details within the scheme. Of course, it would be great to go over every detail of what BRC requirements are and how to satisfy them. That takes several days. It's a reasonably complex program, reasonably complex uh, standard, and if you need to go deeper, if you want more um, in-depth information about the standard, you can always look into sort of uh, getting an approved course. Uh, something SCS would certainly be willing to work with you on. So BRC itself, 16,000 food companies around the world that are certified to the BRC. This means every year we, we oversee over 16,000 site audits, of which almost 1,500 are in the U.S., and that number is growing quite rapidly every year. It, it's got an application across the food chain in the processing side. Now, BRC does not certify farm operations, but as soon as that product is harvested uh, or, or slaughtered, it moves into the applications for processing. Wide range of industries, everything from dairy to fresh fruit to uh, processed vegetables, ready-to-eat meals, right across the entire food spectrum. And it covers, interestingly enough, one of our largest areas is the primary fresh industry. Uh, those suppliers who supply from one country to the next, especially seeing this as a valid export program and enhancer, has always been well used. 
little bit more detail about the use of the BRC within the U.S. You see we have some fairly high density in some areas, primarily centered around where the industry is for the food. California, of course, is one of our largest areas, single states, uh, that has certified sites. Uh, and again, that's growing quite rapidly every day. Beyond the U.S. itself, we're growing more and more within Canada, Mexico, and well into Latin America. I've been spending a fair bit of time with our Latin American partners to help introduce the standard, help develop auditors and uh, with the retailers in Latin America as they see the benefits of the program. BRC, as I mentioned, up till now, this has been talking about the food standard. Now, this is where BRC becomes a little bit more unique. We've actually created three standards that impact the food industry. The food standard, which we've been talking about, and Javid's going to expand a little more on. A standard for companies that manufacture packaging materials, primarily for use in the food industry, but a range of packaging materials. Interestingly, this is now a uh, benchmarked by GFSI. They've moved from just agriculture and food. There's now uh, the opportunity to get a GFSI certification for your packaging suppliers. And currently, we've just completed with GFSI a benchmarking document for logistics suppliers. And the BRC Global Standard for Storage and Distribution will cover those aspects as well. GFSI certification, uh, benchmarking of the programs is set to begin any time. We have one other um, program, which is consumer products. And this is for non-food items, items that would typically be um, consumer items, but not necessarily fall under the food spectrum. By commodity, now this is how BRC looks at industry. One thing we've seen in the past in the food industry could be an auditor that audited everything. They were at a dairy last week, now they're in a slaughter facility, now they're in a fresh produce, and they would be a gen generalist in food safety. BRC has divided the food industry into 18 categories, and you can see them across the bottom of this chart. Thing from red meat to poultry, on to processed goods, and then into specialty things like beverages, bakery, and confectionery. These are the numbers of certificates in North America that BRC currently has. Uh, the interesting thing for most sites about this, we qualify auditors by category. And an auditor that's going to, for example, audit in cooked meats and fish products must have experience in the industry. Someone who's worked their entire um, career in the dairy industry going out to a confectionery facility. So the benefits of that to the sites, they've got someone who understands their process and their products. You're not going to spend half the audit explaining to your auditor what your equipment does and what your products are. That's been a, one of the big changes in GFSI is the allowance of splitting the industry down into more categories. Now, when it comes to getting certified, this is, this is my top-level advice. These are things that absolutely must have if you're going to look towards a successful certification. Obviously, you have to meet the requirements of the standard. The number one overall overarching or corporate perspective really needs to be senior management commitment. And um, BRC is very sees this as a development of the culture, of part of the culture, a facility that simply believes this is a quality department program, something a quality department can handle on their own, is not going to do, be successful in their certification bid. Uh, senior management has to be partnered, has to partner with the quality department on certification and on their food safety and food quality aspects. Um, we will, part of the audit, the auditor will interview senior management, talking about objectives, talking about support, resources, and indeed how they measure and manage food safety and quality customer specifications across their organization. Now, BRC does cover both safety and quality. Our definition of quality, quality is the consistent, consistently meeting your customer specifications or your specifications. So it, it's not whether one product is better than the other, but whether your product and your system consistently deliver what the product's expecting. Second most important, being thorough with your HACCP program. Many of us worked under HACCP-based systems for quite some time. What we want to make sure of is that that HACCP is active, it's viable, it's currently in use. And BRC takes two looks at HACCP. One is the standard HACCP plan, the documentation, the risk assessments about your product, process, supply chain. The second way we look at HACCP is the application. 
safety. ASIP is, of course, one of the largest parts of a food safety audit. About 50% of the time during the audit will be spent both on analysis of the plan and, more importantly, its application within the facility. HACCP is the number one area for nonconformities, BRC standards, or BRC audits. And to be even more detailed, the most common two nonconformities, unfortunately, uh, are HACCP flow diagrams, process flow diagrams, that are not accurate or up-to-date. This doesn't mean that they were simply reviewed in the past year and there's a date on them. This means that if you take that process flow diagram and you walk out onto the floor, you look at the process, all of the inputs, all of the outputs, is it complete? Second most common nonconformity in this area would be um, a thorough risk assessment, that there are known risks within that process that weren't identified in your plan and weren't managed within the plan. So right from the core of HACCP, that's what I urge everyone to do, take out those, ha those two parts of your HACCP plan, your risk assessment, your process flow diagram, and make sure they completely and accurately represent what happens in your facility. Other most important parts, training. Training not just on the standard, but on your process, on food safety in general, on allergens. Approximately 10% of your staff will be interviewed by the auditor during a BRC audit. It's a very unique way of doing an audit, and they want to see what they know about their jobs, what they know about those controls that they're responsible for, how they manage and, and what their responsibilities are when it comes to food safety. So making sure your staff is aware not only of the audit coming up, but their role within the organization and as it relates to your product. Internal audits, these are the best, internal auditing is the best tool you can have in, an, in any industry and certainly applies well to food safety. It's your own internal measurement system. What oversights, what checks and balances do we have? This is the food industry, simply writing a procedure and letting it happen is just not enough. Make sure that it's overseen, it's evaluated, frequency based on risk. Uh, but we do expect to see a good internal audit program by qualified people, people who understand how to audit properly. Especially in the U.S., uh, obviously we have to keep up with regulatory updates. Food Safety Man Modernization Act, very important uh, concept, very important piece of regulation. We have to make sure we understand how does it impact me, how does that relate to me, and what do we need to be able to make sure that we're meeting requirements as they develop. It's not finished yet. It's still in comment period. We need to see the final outcome of it. But we want to make sure that we're keeping up in systems on par with, with the expectations. Number one, absolutely, culture of your organization. And this is senior this goes right back to senior management. This is food we're producing, food that kids are going to be eating, food that everyone is going to be eating. We need to make sure that everyone understands and there's a culture in the organization of here to protect our products, protect our customers, our consumers, and our own industry. We have to make sure that we understand our role and our responsibility within the realm of food safety. Very basic pathway to certification. Get the requirements. Understand what they what what are we being tasked with. If we go back ten years, many of our audits were an auditor coming in with a blank sheet of paper, deciding whether or not trying to find nonconformances or things they didn't like the look of. Now you have the BRC standard and the other schemes, very concise set of expectations. Your job is to make sure you've got evidence support those. So you want to review what the standard requires versus what you have. The parts that are missing are your gaps, those you have to fill. Training, what things need to be implemented, new policies, new procedures, changes to the environment or to the structure. Is there anything in that implementation phase that needs to be completed so that we fill the gaps? We take the parts we have, we fill in the spots that we were missing, and then we know we should be ready. Many companies elect to have a pre-assessment. A pre-assessment is a well audit. Come in, qualified auditor. They'll assess you against the requirements. They'll deliver your report. You, in case there were any nonconformities or gaps that you had missed, it gives you an opportunity to fill those in before moving forward to full certification. Now we can draw a line right about there between I've got the requirements and I'm ready for certification. On average, America, that takes about eight months. Can go a little quicker, obviously, if you have the resources to work on it. Could take longer. Longer does not necessarily mean uh, you have less to start with. It could just mean you're a more robust system. 
certification audit is arranged with your certification body. Now, in that eight-month period, or however long it takes you to get to that point, as soon as you have an idea when you're ready, when you think you'll be ready to certify, I strongly recommend con contacting your certification body. Give SCS a call. Schedule your audit. There are some times of the year where resources can be quite tight. There's none of the GFSI standards have an excess of auditors sitting around waiting to get to work. So, no matter which scheme contact your certification body, make sure you've scheduled in uh, with enough advance warning so that they're going to be able to give you the dates that you want. It doesn't stop once you get your certificate. Now you start your continual improvement, you start building for next year, you start getting ready so that you know you're going to move forward as you uh, and, and get better. The idea is continual improvement and the best uh, perspective is continually maintain that system once you get forward. That's a brief introduction to ERC, I'm going to turn it back to Diane and then uh, over to Javid. Thank you so much, John. Okay, I think I think John, you answered a lot of um, people's introductory questions, and thank you so much for that. I there was even just a, a question that came in that I believe you touched on, and and I'll just note this one, which was, um, will the GFSI level certification standards meet FISMA compliance? And from what you said, it sounded like, yes, that is the ideal path that you are continuing on and that that is one of the requirements that is, being, that is um, part of the BRC um, standard updates is to stay in compliance with the FISMA regulations. But I'll let you get back to that, or maybe you can even answer me that right now. Do you believe that that is, um, is true? That's a, that's a really that's probably one of the most complex questions around in, in the U.S. right now, and, and it's, it's a very good question f uh, for the folks, th the person that sent that in. Um, there are two ways to answer it. One is yes, the other is mostly. Um, FISMA generally, uh, fire verification is one of the cornerstones of FISMA, and very simple rule: you have to you have to verify the food safety management systems of your suppliers. Both foreign suppliers and the foreign supplier verification program and your domestic suppliers. Everyone in the food industry will be responsible to verify the food safety programs or, or, or competency of the food safety programs, efficacy I guess is a better word, of the food safety programs of their supply chain. Now in speaking with the FDA, they are, they are, they are certainly leaning towards GFSI certification is as good as could be expected for that type of verification. So, for example, I'm a manufacturer. I've got 10 ingredient suppliers. Eight of GFSI certified. I can say, yes, that now meets the basic tenets or expectations as they exist now of FISMA. Those two that aren't, well, perhaps I'm going to have to go and audit them. Or I'm going to have to test, based on the risk, the ingredients. So every man, every one in the food industry, everyone that purchases food, be a retailer, food service, or manufacturer, have to have a risk assessment of their supply chain and have adequate measures in place to ensure the safety of the product is intact, whether it be testing on arrival, whether it be perhaps C of A's, although that's, there's some questions there, supplier uh, questionnaires, but certainly the more robust your program is, the better. On a second level, in buried in those pages of the, of the regulations that are moving forward, there are some potentially very prescriptive elements. Uh, two of them I'll call out because they are different from what typically we expect. Every site uh, would be expected, every U.S.-based site would, would be expected to have a food safety expert definition. A com I think the belief that the proper terminology is a competent individual. They will be responsible for the oversight of the food safety management system. By reference, it's expected that your suppliers would be expected to have a competent food safety individual on their staff as well. Will that be measured exact in every GFSI standard today? Perhaps not. So there may either be some addendums or there changes to some of the schemes. The second one is within the HACCP program, the very prescriptive element. Um, typically, we have the three risks in our HACCP program, chemical, biological, and physical. There is the X-like one, you have to add a fourth being radiological. 
99.9% of companies will likely be able to say there are no radiological risks, but the expectation is that comes into comes to bear within your within your program. Um, what uh, the the only my best recommendation is to go to the FDA website. You can get on a subscription list for updates to FISMA, and they are very well written. They're very they're not they're not going to gum up your email um, inbox. And I recommend everyone go and get that so that they can keep up to date and see how changes are, are taking place. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, yes, primarily there may be a few prescriptive elements that you need to touch on as the law gets completed. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that. That answers a lot of my questions as well. And um, again, I, I'm sorry nobody heard me before. That was a, a little glitch. But uh, just to um, let you know, I just basically said please type your questions into the box at the bottom right so that um, we can have those answered. And I'll go through um, an introduction with Javed right now and then at the end of his presentation. Hey Javed, how are you doing? Say hi to everybody. Hi Javed, how are you? Good. Okay, so um, yeah, we, we'll save the questions for the end for you as well. So and, and as well, I'll be sending out um, an email with the slide presentations and a link to the recording, so everyone will have that later. So um, Javed's in our Southern California uh, location down there in his uh, office, and um, he's been a food safety consultant for um, himself for many years, um, I believe 25 or so, and he's worked in Europe and the U.S., so he has um, a lot of very interesting uh, experience with BRC especially. Um, he's a auditor and a trainer. Uh, he's been working with us and we've really appreciated all of his expertise and people in his classes have gotten an awful lot out. He also has been doing some HACCP training for us. Um, and he's, you know, an expert in a number of areas including product recall programs which are very interesting, traceability and, and recall where you can actually do a on-site recall fire drill. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn this over now to Javed, and he'll explain some more about um, the ERC program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, well, what we're going to look at here is that we're going to look at the, the differences between the GMP audit, um, stroke HACCP audit, and BRC. We're going to look at the challenges that it faces um, when you uh, implement and basically conduct or, or carry out a uh, uh, a BRC audit as well, and then we're going to look at the benefits as well. I'm going to basically shut my um, my my video now, and I'll basically talk um, talk the um, the scheme through now. So the scope of the BRC audit, the, the BRC standard addresses a, a a comprehensive set of uh, product safety issues as well as the legal and due diligence responsibilities. So what it's saying basically, it, it forms a basis for you to to be active and have all your team members in your facility to work together. That's basically what it's trying to do. And the accountability is very, very important as well. The accountability of of your of your company is important, is a paramount. Yeah. So BRC certification requires uh, the adaptation of implementation of hazard analysis, document and quality management systems. Um, practices, procedures for factory environmental performance, manufacturing personnel, and the BRC standards for uh, food products requires a scored and graded audit. So you could get a grade level of A, B, or C. And if you enroll, if you go for another option, which is called an enrollment uh, um, uh, option, you can get a score if you don't meet the grade levels A, B, or C. And I'll explain that a bit later on. Oh, um, what is required in a GFIS scheme audit that is not required in a GAP or GMP audit? Um, certification scheme audits have to comply with the standard. Um, if you've got any non-compliance in your BRC audit, um, you need to correct them to gain certification, and you're given a specific time. And usually, it's, usually it's 20 within 28 days. When I say usually, it is 28 days. Um, and you have to comply that rule within the days. Uh, certification audits are primarily based on quality and food safety monitoring systems and require more extensive documentation than GAP GMP audits. So basically what we're saying here is that it's got to be more detailed 
it's got to provide evidence that you have um, your food safety management um, systems under control. That's what they're looking for, under control, and what can happen if things go wrong. Um, what is your contingency plan? Are you gonna Are you gonna make sure that there is no issues uh, with regards to, to to any breaches in food safety and quality? One of the main things, the difference uh, between doing these audits and implementation, is the culture. You really have to build a culture within your company to make sure that you you're all pulling together and you're on the same team, and you basically have what we call uh, a trail, uh, a trail process where you are in control of any issues that are occurring within your facility. So I'll give you an example, and probably that's the best way to basically link this this culture in. And one of the examples is I've, I've numbered it number one is uh, called departmental links on glass breakage in process line. Okay, so look at that scenario, and first thing you're going to ask for yourself is that who is going to be involved in this? Well, let's look at it. If you get a glass breakage in the process, the operator is going to stop the line, inform the production supervisor or manager, who will in turn inform the quality assurance um, personnel. This quality person, uh, uh, personnel will assess the situation and then start moving on the process of, of controlling this. Okay? So then you would say, yourself, okay, we're going to call in sanitation, clean the area. Once sanitation is done, that maintenance will come in. Maintenance will come in and basically if there's any work that's required to be done to ensure that it doesn't happen again and find this work, the, uh, the root cause analysis, which a word that we really use um, frequently in BRC, root cause analysis. What is the source of the problem? Okay? You find that out. And then once that's done, you start basically cleaning um, your area, QA inspects it, and then it's released. So what we're doing here, and if, uh, and if this was an audit uh, uh, situation, that the auditor would require this trail. It needs, and the company needs to demonstrate that these activities have been conducted, and there's evidence behind that. So you'd have to do it by action and also by the paperwork uh, trail as well. Okay. Now, another example would be is senior management commitment, which John mentioned as well. And it's very, very serious that a company, and it's a priority that a company basically looks at this. And it's got to come from the top. So I'll give you another scenario. An example two cooking vessel breakdown. If a cooking vessel breaks down and you've got a product in there and the temperature is not going up, the production personnel will report this. And then QA will look at it and assess it with regards to food safety. Or if there's a quality issue, maybe uh, uh, assessing the quality issue. But if it's a temperature uh, issue, then it's going to be food safety. Then they're going to say, well, what's the problem here? So they try and basically get, um, get to the cause of the problem. But before they, they do that, there's got to be some control in that. Corrective action has to be taken to ensure this product is not contaminated. So you would go through a procedure to not contaminate this. For instance, you would decant the, um, the product into another uh, container and put it into another vessel. That is a corrective action that you've taken. It's not a root cause analysis, that's a corrective action that you've taken. Then you will evaluate, a maintenance will come in and evaluate the cost of repairs and also the time it's, come, it's taken um, to repair this. Yeah. Now this information has to be then passed on to the senior management because under the BRC standard, there are at least three types of meetings or reviews that the senior management will be involved in. One is an objective review, which is done on a quarterly basis, minimum quarterly basis. One is what we call a report to senior management on a monthly, minimum monthly basis, and a whole year senior review um, management meeting as well. So they are in constantly um, in communication with the departments. So this information needs to go to the senior management. 
and that senior management will then provide the resources to ensure that this doesn't work, uh, this doesn't happen. And again, it's important, it's imperative that we look at this root cause analysis. And that's where we want to basically hit, uh, hit our issues here and get that right. What's that different? What's the difference between that and GMP? Well, the GMP is going to be just going to basically say, well, have you had any corrective actions? Have you done a corrective action? Yes, we have. This is what we've done, and this, this is the documentation. On a BRC audit, it's going to ask for more. It needs that trail. It needs to show, demonstrate that senior management was involved. Maintenance has got records of repairing uh, um, um, the, the issue. It needs to basically uh, see that QA uh, acknowledged it and, and basically highlighted this issue as a food safety or quality issue. Um, and then obviously uh, production is reporting this. We move on um, and we look at another example, and this time it's on training and competency. Now, training provided on specific jobs to employers is not enough. Now, if you went to a, uh, uh, if you did a GMP or even a house audit, they'll say, "Well, have you had training provided?" And and you'll say, "Yes, I have." And you provide them the evidence and documentary evidence. What BRC is also saying here is that you need uh, you need to provide or demonstrate that the employee is competent, competent enough to do his or her work. And example I'm giving here, example three which is temperature measurement. And if you look at temperature measurement of food in a vessel, you're going to ask the question, or the auditor is going to ask the question, is why are, you, why are you measuring this temperature? What is the significance of measuring this temperature? What is it trying to do? Is it going to kill the pathogenic bacteria? At what temperature is it going to kill the, uh, kill the bacteria? How are you measuring the temperature? Are you using a calibrated probe, temperature probe, where are you locating that? And why are you locating it at a specific um, area? What's the significance behind that? If, you, if you're measuring the temperature, can you read the temperature? How, how is the results going to be recorded? If there's a breach in food safety and quality, is it reported? How is it reported? Is it documented or is it done verbally? Usually, it's got to be documented. And our, our control procedures are readily available to employees. And that means that it's got to be available in their relevant language as well, so they understand that. And where is it placed, these procedures? Is it somewhere accessible to the employees? I'll give you another example. It is root cause analysis. Now, root cause analysis, auditors will assess whether a company has adequately addressed underlying cause of problem, which will prevent a reoccurrence of that problem. So you're going to look at that. And you're going to say, well, and I'm giving an example here, example four, where non-conformance of a product losing heat in a jacketed vessel and not allowing product to be heated at the desired temperature. Now, that in itself is an issue. Now, you could correct it. You could correct it easily by saying, okay, let's, let's use another vessel, which is next to it, and let's put the product in there and start heating it, and the problem is solved. That's fine, but that's not going to be enough. You really need to find out where the problem is. And for an example, for this, for this issue, it could be a boiler issue where there is a, an air trap mentioned. In the, in the process or in the boiler, which is not allowing the heat to be dissipated um, uniformly. So that is a root cause analysis. So once you know that, you've got to basically try and eliminate that problem. Yeah. Another example is customer complaints that reoccur. Now, if it reoccurs, that means that you've not really addressed the root cause analysis. And an auditor, BRC audit, auditor, will take issue with regards to that. Okay. Let me just go back. I might have missed one slide before. I know I have. Now, another example is uh, which difference between the, the, the BRC and, and GMP audits is 
the outsourcing of processing. Now, imagine this as a scenario. You have a facility yeah, which, put, which um, brings in liquid egg, egg. You then mix this uh, liquid egg into a slurry in your facility, and then you send it to another company to dehydrate the eggs. So it comes in in a powdered format back into your facility. The company who's providing you the service where they've dehydrated it is called an outsource company. Now, on a GMP audit, you might, you might just be forgiven to just give, in, to give a supplier questionnaire saying that this is the company I'm using and these are our, their standards and they're filled in the supplier questionnaire. Well, on the BRC certification audit, that is not the case. They're not looking for that. They're looking at a more detailed information. And this information is this. The company then has to prove, prove that the outsourced process is taken off-site and this has been declared to the brand owner and where required, approval granted. So before you even do this outsourcing, you as a company have got the obligation to tell your brand owner that you are going to do that. And then if, if it's required, they, they, will, they will approve this action. Now, the subcontractor who's going to um, dehydrate your liquid milk needs to be monitored, and it needs to be monitored successfully. And when we, when we use the word successful, it means that you as a company will have to complete a successful site audit of that subcontractor, uh, subcontractor. Or the subcontractor must provide a third-party certification to BRC or other GFSI recognized standards. So a supplier audit questionnaire is not going to be enough. It needs, more, um, it needs you to either go to, to the uh, facility and conduct an audit or provide or the or the subcontractor provides a third party certification yeah, to BRC or the GFSI standards. The outsourced processing operation shall have established contracts which clearly defines processing requirements and product specs. So you will have to basically discuss this and you say, okay, this is the parameters of the processing. This is what we want. This is the spec we want. And you agree to that spec and you basically sign off. The outsource process shall maintain product traceability. When they conduct this work for you, as they've taken that liquid egg from you, they would need to provide this, the, uh, the product back to you with full traceability. What they've done, how they've basically done the processing, yeah? and then if it comes back to your facility, that traceability is intact. And it's up to you. The onus is on, on you as a company to ensure that the traceability is correct as well. Accurate, sorry, not correct. Um, inspection and test procedures for out, uh, outsourced product on return dependent on risk assessment. So when it comes back to your facility after it's had the drying process, you would have to conduct some inspection and tests. Okay? Now that's going to be based on your risk assessment, what, what you consider is a risk factor, and that's what John was talking about when he's saying that the HACCP, the HACCP uh, um, the process, the HACCP process process will then will, will come into fruition uh, and you will look at it with regards to risk assessment. Now, so it basically leads me very, very nicely into risk assessment. And if you talk about risk assessment, BRC standard has got risk assessment written throughout its standards. Throughout it is BRC standards. So, example seven: okay, use of um, use of wood unavoided in open product area. Now, on the BRC standard, it says that you should basically not use wood. But there is a, a case that is, if it's unavoidable, you can use it. But you have to basically look at it in terms of monitoring this wood and whether or not it will cause any physical uh, contamination or, or any types of contamination, biological or, or chemical. So you would basically look at it in terms of conducting a risk assessment on that. So an, a, a classic example is, which I, I went through with one of, one of my um, companies I consulted was that they had almonds arriving at the facility 
and they used large wooden containers. And, and basically, these were lined in blue-colored uh, food grade uh, plastic liners. Now, the issue here was, we, we were looking at this, and the issue here was that when they decanted the, the whole of the container into another plastic, impervious, um, um, hard-wearing container, there was a lot of um, dust flying into the environment, and there was a lot of particulates basically going into the environment as well. So it was, call, it was really causing a problem here. So what we did was we did a risk assessment there and said, well, if it's causing a problem, let's not, let's not basically elevate this problem. So they basically used the, the containers, they took it to a hopper where the containers were tilted at around, say, 45 degrees, which didn't allow this dust to, to, um, to basically fly up, um, So which reduced the level of contamination. And then it was already going, going to go through a sieving process, so the, so the physical contaminants were going to be removed. So this was, this was a sort of a win-win situation for, for the company. So what we did was we, we assessed the risk. We then basically um, looked at the, the, the potential hazards, and then we started to control the potential hazards by writing a procedure. Okay. Moving on to... Next slide. Next slide is the, um, the zonal classification. Um, now, in BRC, there is a classification on the actual um, um, areas where you produce your products. And they're looking at that in terms of low risk, high risk, and high care. Now, this may really depends on the, the type of product you are going to process. Yeah? So if you consider raw meat, which has got a lot of, lot of bacteria in there and also pathogenic bacteria in there, you're going to basically have a process where you're going to bring in the meat, you're going to portion the meat, and then you're going to you're going to portion the meat, you're going to pack it, and, you're going, and then you're going to sell it raw to the retailer. So that is going to be considered low-risk processing area in BRC. Okay. Now, if you're doing prepared salads where you've got to show a degree of, of hygiene standards, which is going to be, very, uh, it's going to be higher than the low-risk area, then you've got to basically look at it in terms of do you need a physical segregation to ensure that um, the product is going to be safe and hygienic and there's not going to be contamination from any other product that is made um, during this um, um, preparation of salad? If you cannot achieve a physical seg uh, segregation on this, on the high care zo uh, zonal classification, you would then look at it in terms of risk assessment and you would find out or work out a procedure that will alleviate the contamination problem. Okay. Now, moving on to the high risk or high risk zone. So if you've got raw meat and you're going to basically cook this raw meat uh, and then you're going to sell it as cooked meat, you then have to have a physical segregation of raw meat to cooked meat to avoid any cross-contamination. And then if you go into the BRC standards, it gives you a, a, a zonal guideline of what, what criteria um, a process, a product will, will, will fall into, or which zonal uh, process it will fall in, into in detail. And I would suggest that you would ask your, 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 your certification body as well that this is what we're doing, and they may be able to um, clarify certain aspects for you there. They may not give you they, they may not give you advice on what it is, but they may be able to clarify situations as well. And then there's always there's always myself and John is uh, is also available to ask us if you have any issues with regards to that as well. Okay. How do you how do you achieve BRC certification? Well, usually um, it is a two day audit based on the information provided to your certifying body. And again, your certifying body will give you clarity on how many days it's going to take. But they will require you to give them information. And the information is things like where is your location, 
how many shifts are you doing in your facility? How many lines are you producing in your facility? How many people are employed um, uh, in, your, in your area? Um, and if you provide those information, then the certifying body will be able to work, work out how many days that it, it, it will take. The actual BRC certification process, well, you have to purchase the booklet because the booklet, which is the BRC food safety standard, global standard for food safety issue six, um, will provide you the information of what you require um, to meet uh, certification um, requirements. So it will go through all the seven uh, requirements that you would, you would need to comply against the standard. So you have to basically purchase the booklet. Um, you, you would assess, you would then assess your company standards against the current issue of the standards, at the current issue of the BRC global standards. And then you would look at the, the any non-conformities and see whether or not you can address these non-conformities. Now, you may, you may take this, this number four option where you might say, well, okay, I'm going to purchase a booklet, but I might also go for a BRC training course. And it might basically uh, provide me with some um, uh, clarity and a know-how to implement the standards. Yeah. You then might say to yourself, well, okay, I might use a, a, a reputable consultant, um, uh, which, will, which will help me along the way um, uh, during the implementation process as well. Now, this is what I call an optional. Uh, an optional um, choice. If you have expertise in your company, do that yourself. Do that yourself because you're going to know your process better than anyone else or any other consultant. You know, you know your challenges that you face more than, more than consultants. So if you have expertise, use them. And also there's a guidance booklet as well provided. Um, not provided, you have to purchase that from, 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 from uh, BRC. If you go to the BRC website, you can, um, they, they've got um, information with regards to this guidance, bo uh, guidance booklet, which will help you to interpret, uh, interpret, uh, interpret the, uh, the global standards. Okay. Now, again, this is optional. Now, if you feel that you don't have the expertise, then, yeah, by all means, um, go and use a, um, a consultant. And if you, again, go onto the BRC website, they've got a list of approved BRC consultants. Now moving on to five. Once you've done your area nonconformity, um, you do what you call a site pre-assessment, uh, and it's usually carried out by a selected certification body. And and someone like SCS can provide you the, with this service, where they would come in and they would they would um, conduct this pre-assessment like a, a BRC audit. Okay, now, again, they, they're not going to provide you advice, but they will basically prescribe where your nonconformances are so that you can work on your nonconformances. Okay. Now, once, once all this is done, you can then have a choice as well, saying, well, look, what type of audits do I need to, uh, what type of audit should I, should I go into? Should I go into this enrollment audit, or should I go into an announced or unannounced? Now, the enrollment audit is for someone who's basically new to the standard, and they might feel as if saying that, well, we still need to improve, but we want to basically have a go at that and, and, and make what we call a, a continued improvement. So this enrollment audit is, will be very, very good for you because at the end of that audit, you will be given a percentage score. However, if you do really well and if you meet the the grade levels of A, B, and C, you will be given a grade. So it is like an announced audit, but with the win-win situation of saying that if you can't, if you don't achieve the grade level, you can then have a percentage score, which basically goes on to your uh, record as saying you're going to move on and, uh, and continue to improve your, your standards. Okay. The announced audit is where someone calls in your certifying body and says, okay, I'd like to have this audit at this, at this date. Okay? The unannounced audit is a bit more complex where you have to initially 
get a grade A or B, certification grade, grade or B, before you can go into what we call an unannounced audit. An unannounced audit, as it sounds, means that the certifying body will come in to your facility unannounced. And there are two options of unannounced, which I'm not going to really go into it because it's going to basically confuse, uh, uh, confuse the issue here. But all, all you need to know at the moment is that there is that provision to go to do an unannounced audit if you've already gained certification at grade A or B level. Okay? And then you can then um, select the unannounced audit within three months of gaining that A or B certification. Okay? So just to recap on that one, selection of type of audit, enrollment, announced, and unannounced. You have a choice. If it's first time, you basically go for enrollment or announced. Uh, a lot of the companies that I've worked with, they've really gone for enrollment um, where they basically gained some confidence and they and if they feel confident, they basically got got onto the announced one and they've they've passed uh, you know with flying colours. Okay. So Selection of certifying body, as I mentioned, SCS is available um, um, to cater for your needs with regards to that. They are uh, BRC accredited, so um, they will um, they will be um, uh, available um, to conduct the compliance audit for you. Um, uh, once you've selected your your certifying body, you're going to look at it in terms of the contractual arrangement and you will sort that out with your certifying body. And once you're talking about the contractual uh, um, arrangement, make sure you confirm your audit score. It is very, very important to confirm your audit score and tell your certifying body what you are actually doing. What are you processing? Because we don't want to be in a situation where you, you've, got, you've said one thing that you, you're processing this, and when the certifying body, uh, body comes in to do the audit, you're not actually doing what you've said, and it's very important. And also, you can have confusions with regards to the type of auditor that the certifying body will send to conduct the audit. So again, the information given to certifying body is very, very important. So I'll give you an example of this. If, if you were manufacturing a, if you were manufacturing baby food, as compared to another company who was manufacturing a, uh, um, a cooked, frozen, ready-to-eat product, the two standards are going to be different in terms of its hazards okay, and its control. The baby food is going to be more, is going to have more priority on, it, on, its, on its standards and it's going to be more stringent as opposed to the cook freeze one, the ready-to-eat one. Although both are going to be very important, and you you know you've got to have your food safety management systems in place, um, but it's the selection of auditor then. If that auditor has been doing baby food and it comes in and does the the um, the cook freeze a product which the auditor hasn't much experience on, then there's going to be an issue because it's going to it, the auditor is going to uh, say that it, it's got to follow a stringent measure and it might not be required for the type of product you're making. So it's important to get that right. Okay. Once you've confirmed your scope, you then start, as a company, start to plan and prepare for the audit. You basically look at what you've got to do and you start building. You're building, the, this word is culture. Building your culture. And in terms of building your culture, there's going to be a lot of training, competency of, of the employees. You've got to look at... Um, the type of information, communication that you're going to basically provide. And again, as John was mentioning, the senior management commitment comes in where you have prescribed plan meetings with your senior management to say, to give them an update of what's happening and give you call a progress report of what's happening within your facility. And the progress report, one of the best ways to do progress report is to conduct what we call internal audits within your facility. So you've got to conduct internal audits, which will mostly uh, will include all the activities that you, 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 you conduct in your, uh, in your process or in your facility. Okay. Once you're comfortable with that, and usually you implement your standards and you're looking at around the three months, you implemented it and you're working with your implemented standards for I would say a minimum of three months, you then are ready 
for your audit. The audit will be carried out by the certification body and any non-conformities and corrective actions um, will be completed by yourself as a company. And if it's successful, then you will get a certification grade, which could be A, B, or C. Or if you're an enrollment, and if you've not really achieved the A, B, and C, you will move on to get a percentage score. Yeah. BRC compared to other standards, as we mentioned, the emphasis is about senior management commitment and HACCP. The two, those two are linked. And also what, what else is linked is your process control. How, how we're basically looking at the process control. That has got to be linked with, with senior management commitment and HACCP as well. Um, segregation of process and areas which we touch slightly on. We talked about the low risk, high risk, and, 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 and uh, high care. One code, one level, they're looking at it in terms of food safety, and there are some aspects of quality in there because they're looking at organoleptic testing, and they're looking at what we call chef life testing as well. So that's also included in there. Traceability exercises to be completed within four hours. Um, there is no mandate on employing the practitioner. It's a team effort, although you will have a HACCP coordinator, but it's, it's basically, it's about accountability. It's about accountability from each department, and you're working towards this. You're working towards this goal of continual improvement. Okay? Fundamental requirements of the standards have to be met. There's 10 of them. Um, the audit time is less, and the audit cost can be less as well, depending on your, on your, um, your days of audits. Benefits, well, it is nationally uh, and internationally recognized, as John had it in his slides, over 16,000 uh, throughout the world have been certified. It has a comprehensive scope. It basically builds a foundation for you, a foundation of food safety and management and, 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 and quality. Uh, and also it gives the, the prestige of departments owning their own accountability. They're, they're accountable for what they're doing. And if it's done properly, it works like clockwork. Okay? Quality and hygiene systems are going to be enhanced. As we said, it is accredited. It is a certified, uh, a certified audit. Um, it also provides customers with confidence that you've, you've conducted a BRC certifying, uh, certification audit. Um, reduction in number of audits is debatable, but but this is not time to talk about the, the, uh, the, the actual, um, whether or not it's going to reduce the, the number of audits. It probably needs another topic on that. Um, uh, viewed on the public, uh, BRC public directory, it is continual improvement, uh, and the standard is asking for that. And as I said, it's going to create a strong food safety culture within departments, and that's what you're trying to aim at. Yeah? It is food safety, legality, and quality. That's what we're trying to say. Those are the three words, food safety, legality, and quality. And lastly, controlling waste man management. As a default, if you have this system, if you, put, if, if you implement this BRC standard or BRC system in place, you by default will start controlling your waste management because you know where the issues are, the challenges are, and then you can save money in that, and that money then can be discussed in your senior management meeting and say, look, we need, we need resources to train, competently train our, our staff, and, or, or we need to have improvements in our, in our machinery or our structure. And this, if you save this um, uh, money on, on waste management, you can then put that back into your, to your company. And okay. This is, this is where I stop. Thank you. That's, thank you very much, Javed. I appreciate that. This I am again. And um, I'm just going to, um, I know we're running a little bit late, so I'm just, we just have, I think, two uh, questions to go through. Um, one is, um, I think, for Javed, what about the management of external warehouses? Do they need to get yeah. GFSI certified as well? Well, you've got to be careful with this one because the management of external warehouses uh, what they say in the standard that if you have a BRC um, certification, it's, it's, it, it, it's approved, but it's only approved if it's like for like. Uh, you could have a, an ambient warehouse, which is GFSI certified, 
and you've got a a um, a frozen or chilled item, then if that's the case, and you want to you want to use that external um, warehouse, then you would have to uh, uh, then that's not going to suffice. You would have to go for life for life a GFSI certified um, chilled frozen warehouse. Now, if you wanted to use someone which is um, um, uh, an ambient or, or, or sort of warehouse, then you would have to ask the questions whether or not they can facilitate your need. So that's how you've got to do it. So like for like warehouse, yes. If it's not like for like, then you have to basically go through what you call an assessment. And you have to go through the full assessment as you would do on a supplier, a supply questionnaire. I hope that yeah, answers that's... your question, Jorge. That does sound a little bit more complicated and probably needs to be looked at a little more carefully per example, which yeah. we can we can take care of things like that by um you know getting letting them get back with you about you know their particular needs. Yeah. 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 Okay. And another question, um, one other was how can we trust a COA coming from overseas? What is guarant the guarantee that they've adhered to GFSI? Well, that's a, that's a difficulty with COAs because COA is as good as what you sample, and I and I agree with you. Um, what is a COA, Javed? Um, yeah. What is a COA? Well, Can you just explain that too? Yeah, it's it's called um, certificate of uh, of assurance. Okay. COA. Okay. Yeah. So, so what that basically. To me, I don't think it's a good way of basically saying that the, the product is, um, you know, you're guaranteeing anything. You would need more. For me, a letter of guarantee is much better because what you're asking for from your company is something like this. An example would be, I, JA Food Assurance, um, will ensure that the product that I am going to supply to you is going to meet your food safety and quality standards. And the way that I will meet your food safety quality standards is that I have a HACCP team and I'm committed to providing the resources to my HACCP team. And also I'm committed in um, conducting meetings where I will listen and engage in conversations where I can improve and support, improve food safety and quality. So something, I'm not saying like that, but something of that type of nature means more to me than uh, a certificate of uh, of analysis because a certificate of, of analysis, all it's doing is taking a represented or taking a sample and saying it's okay. The sample could be small or large. You can't you can't dictate that. It's very very difficult. Okay. So I would say, as a due diligence exercise, you need to ask more. You need to, that COA is not enough for me. I, I'm going to ask more. I want that letter of guarantee. I'm going to give them a supplier um, questionnaire. I need them to fill that in, and I need to ask the, 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 the focus in the questions that that really um, is required in this uh, supply questionnaire. Okay, okay. I think that that's a good answer for that one. Great. And um, John, I think there's just one other follow-up question from the earlier one about the FISMA rules, and it, that was, you know, is BRC going to update the standard per the FISMA rules when they do finally finalize? Uh, thanks. It's yeah. I ex BRC intends to um, ensure that our standard meets the expectations of GFSI. Just a little, or sorry, of FISMA. A little bit about timelines. Um, I believe today uh, FDA just sent out a note that they're extending the comment period on two sections of FISMA for another 60 days. So they're still going to be into the early 2014. Uh, the FDA will be bringing in commentary on supplier verification and the food safety programs, preventative controls for food safety. Um, expect that there'll be probably a couple of months of evaluation of those comments, then reiteration of the regulations. They'll go through um, review. Most likely we're talking about late 2015 or so before the rules come into effect. So there, there is, this isn't something that, you know, tomorrow you'll see a, a variation on the um, FISMA requirements, but certainly our expectation, it's, it's got a huge impact around the world, not just in the U.S. Uh, sure. Tends to be able to make the changes necessary so that um, you can 
those that are importing and those that are manufacturing and, and looking at their throughout the supply chain are going to be happy with what BRC gives them, and BRC is going to satisfy the expectations within um, TISMA. So yeah, okay. so basic answer. The easy answer is yes. There will be the the intention is BRC will will be able to satisfy the requirements or, or show due diligence towards satisfi satisfaction satisfaction of uh, FISMA. Great. Okay. Wonderful. And did John, yeah. did you want to add any more? You said to maybe yes. that last COA question. Did you have something? Well, actually, the, yes, funny, the two questions are quite related, both the C of A and the, the external warehouse. Um, anything that you're bringing into your facility, whether it's a supplier or a supply, um, as Javid had mentioned, you have to do a risk assessment. There will be times if you're buying, if you're a baker and you're purchasing flour from a local flour mill and you've been purchasing that flour for the past 20 years and you have a good uh, track record with them, perhaps that's an instance where a C of A would be quite acceptable. Uh, I, the original question, I think, was can you trust a C of A from overseas? Um, you know, you, you have that's part of your risk assessment. Can we trust a C of A? And if you, you, your management of your suppliers could be as simple as C of A's or a questionnaire or a test on arrival. It could be as complex as you auditing them or requiring that they become GFSI uh, certified or certified to one of the GFSI programs. So um, the the answer is, can you, tr can you trust it? No, you can't. As a blanket statement, you can't trust a C of A uh, from, from a supplier. It doesn't have to be overseas or not. Uh, could it be possible to do a thorough rest? Assessment that the C of A would satisfy uh, parts of that supplier assessment. Sure, it is possible, but from overseas, I would agree that's where it's less likely. I think, as Javid mentioned, you would accept a C of A from an overseas supplier, especially one you only infrequently purchase from or you don't add intimately. Uh, you would expect to see a more robust oversight, perhaps GFSI, perhaps some other type of pro oversight program, or perhaps you're going to go and audit them. Okay, great. Well, then I'll just ask um, if either of you would like to say anything more, or we can just wrap up now. Yeah, Diane, just just on the um, the FISMA, um, I just want to basically add that um, what FISMA is also doing is uh, on the HACCP is that if you are assessing and doing a risk assessment on your your, your the HACCP process, um, if you use the word significant and saying that there, there is a significant risk of uh, um, of potential uh, uh, of a potential hazard, you would have to start writing procedures for that, um, and then what you've got to do with that is that you have to monitor that, um, which could get try quite tricky if you've got something like pest control, because pest control there is a significant hazard. So if you basically um, classify that as a significant hazard, then you're going to start writing procedures and and, and also monitoring. Uh, procedures as well. So, so your weekly pest control contractor that comes in on a weekly basis may not be enough. So just just bear that in mind. Um, so it's it, 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 it's and, and and as what John said, it is it is still you know, there's a lot of things that need to be worked out, and that I see as an issue uh, with with FISMA. With FISMA, mm-hmm. So you're saying that you think that the FISMA regulations are asking you to classify something, and you have to be quite aware of. Are they asking you how to classify it as a risk? And then let's say you have a BRC certification, and and you did put it down as I I don't know how it was, you know, um, listed in well, BRC. BRC. Uh, actually, BRC will hold its own because when you do a risk assessment, you you know you do a significant, and then if you get a significant um, hazard, you would then put it into a prerequisite requirement and procedures. Okay, but what FISMA will do is that if you do that and and, and you put it as a prerequisite requirement and it's significant, they want a monitoring procedure now as well on that. So. So it's okay if you did metal detection and, and, and you put it as a prerequisite requirement. That's fine. But well, if you did pest control and it was and if it was considered as significant, then your monitoring procedure is going to increase. So your weekly or, or two weekly monitoring procedures, uh, monitoring of, of pest control, might have to be increased on a daily basis. So you have to look at it in terms of the structure and fabrication, and you have to do, um, conduct inspections. Okay. So that's 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 another thing with with FISMA. 
that could happen. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Javed and John, for taking part in our webinar. We appreciate it, and we always are you know, relying on you both um, for your knowledge on the subject and your helpful support. And so I'd just like to say thank you to everybody else for attending our webinar. Um, you know, SES is here to help you get through whatever um, food safety issues and quality issues. We have a testing division as well. And we do interesting things like flavor management as well. You can check us out more on our website. And um, uh, we, are, we have the ability to do um, any of the audits for BRC that are food related. Right now we're not doing the packaging, but we hope to in the future. Um, so I guess I'd say that we're convenient. We, are, we do work in Latin America as well as the United States. We are fast. We usually get our certifications done very efficiently, and we are affordable. We are very upfront with all of our fees, and we are responsive, and we really are dedicated. We have a good team to help you all out. So um, thank you again, and um, I will, you know, if anybody has any questions, please just email back to myself or to Yao, who sent you out the um, materials. And I want to thank Yao also for his help. He, who's organizing a lot of our event today. So um, we look forward to talking with you. Thanks.